Okay, welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas for Amazon Remars, two days of coverage. We're getting down to wrapping up day one. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. Space is a big topic here. You got machine learning, you got automation robotics, all spells Mars. The two great guests here to really get into the whole geo scene, what's going on with the data. We got Marcus Norgren, business developer in GeoData, Sugeti, part of Capgemini Group, and Joachim Walkist, portfolio lead data and AI with Sugeti, part of Capgemini. Gentlemen, thanks for coming on theCUBE, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for Thank having you. us. Glad to be so here. coming all the way from Sweden to check out the scene here and get into the weeds and the show, a lot of great technology being had. Space is the top line here, but software drives it. Um, you got robotics, a lot of satellite. You got the aerospace industry colliding with hardcore industrial, I say IOT, robotics, want to quote it, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. But space kind of highlights the IOT opportunity. There is no edge in space, right? Exactly. So the edge, the intelligent edge, a lot going on in space, and satellite's one of them. You guys are in the middle of that. What are you guys working on? What's the, the focus here for we, Capgemini, or so Getty part of Capgemini? I would say we focus a lot on creating business value, real business value for our clients, with the satellites available, actually a freely available satellite images, working five years now with this uh, solutioning, and uh, mostly in vegetation management and forestry. That's our main focus. So what's the product value you guys are offering? We basically, for now, the, the most value we created is working with a forest client to find bark beetle infestations uh, in spruce forests. It's a big problem in European Union and uh, northern region, Sweden, where we live. Now with the climate change, it's getting warmer. The bark beetle, they swarm more times during the summer, which makes it spread exponentially. Uh, so we help with the satellite images together with data science and AI to find these infestations in time when they are small, before it's spread. So satellite imagery combined with data, this is the intersection of the data piece, the geo data, right? Mm. Yeah, you can say that. You have uh, a lot of open satellite data uh, and uh, you want to analyze that, but you also need to know what you're looking for and you need a data to understand, in our case, a certain type of damage. So you have large data sets that we have to sort of clean and train ML models on to try to run that on that open data to detect these models. And, and when we're saying satellite data and open data, it's basically one pixel is 10 by 10 meters, so it's mm -hmm. not that you will see the trees, yeah. but we're looking at the spectral information in the image and finding patterns. So we can actually detect attacks that are like four or five trees big uh, using that type, and we can do that throughout the season. So we can see how you start yeah. seeing one, two attacks, and it's just growing, and then you have this big area of just damage. To so how long trees. does that take? Give me some scope to scale, because it sounds easy. Oh, the satellites are looking down on us. Hmm. It's not, it's a lot of data there. What's the complexity? What are the challenges that you guys are overcoming? Scope it's, to scale. It's so much complexity in this. First, you have clouds. So it's an uh, open data set, you download it and you figure out, here we have a satellite scene which is cloudy. We need to have some analytics doing that, taking that image away basically, or the section of the image which is cloudy. Then we have a cloud-free image. We can't see anything because it's blurry. It's too low resolution, so we need to stack them on top of each other. And then we have a next problem, to correlate them so they are pixel perfect overlapping, yeah. so we can compare them in time. And then we have a histogram adjustment to make them like uh, the, uh, the sensitivity is the same on all the images because you have solar storms, you have shady clouds, yeah. which uh, could be used uh, still that image. So we need to compare that. Then we have the ground truth data coming from uh, a harvester, for instance. We got 200,000 data points from a harvester. Real data points where they had found bark beetle trees and they pulled them down. The GPS is drifting 50 meters. So you have an uncertainty where the actually harvested was. And then we had a crane on 20 meters. So you know, the GPS is on, yeah. the, on the actual machine and the crane were somewhere. So you don't really know, you have this uncertainty. It's a data integration problem. Yeah. Massive. A lot of, of uh, interesting uh, things to adjust for. And then you could combine this into one deep learning model and build a solution. But on top of that, I don't know if you said that, but you also get the data in the winter and you have the problem during the summer. So we actually have to move back in time to find the problem, label the data, and mm -hmm. then we can yeah. start identifying it. 
So once you get all that heavy lifting done or, yeah. or write the code, or I don't know if something's going on there, you get the layering, the pixel packs, see all the, how complex that is. Mm. When the deep learning takes over, what happens next? Is it scale? Is it is all the heavy lifting up front? Is the work done up front? Or yeah, is it scale on the back end? So first, the coding is a heavy work, right? To get hands on and try different things, figure out in math how to work with this uncertainty and get everything solved. Then you put it into a deep learning model to train that. It actually run for 10 days before it was accurate. Well, first, first iteration, it wasn't accurate enough, so we scrapped that, did some changes, then we run it again for 10 days. Then, we have a model which we could use and, and interfere new p images, like every day, pretty quickly. Every day it comes a new image, we run it, we have a new outcome, and we could deliver that to clients. Yeah, I can almost imagine, I mean, the, the cloud computing comes in handy here. Oh, yeah. So take me through the benefits, because it sounds like, the old, the old expression, the juice is not worth the squeeze. Here it is worth the squeeze if you yeah. can get it right. Because the alternative is what? More expensive gear, different windows, just more expensive monolithic uh, solutions, right? Think about the data here. So it's satellite scene. Every satellite scene is 100 by 100 kilometers. So Pretty Massive. much, right? And then you need a lot of these satellite scene over multiple years to combine it. So if you should do this over the whole Northern Europe, over the whole globe, it's a lot of data. Just to store that, it's a problem. You, you cannot do it on-prem, and then you should compute it with deep learning models. It's a hard problem if awesome. you don't Well, have you guys got a lot going on. So, so talk about Spaghetti, part of Capgemini. Explain that relationship, because you're here at a show that, you know, you got, I can see the Capgemini angle. This is like a little division. Is it a group? Are you guys like lone wolves? Like what's it, like, is this dedicated, purpose-built focus around so, aerospace? No, it's actually, so Spaghetti so was the, the name of the Capgemini company from the beginning, and they okay. relaunched the brand uh, 2001, I think, roughly 10, uh, 20 years ago, so we actually celebrate some anniversary now. Uh, and it's a, a brand which is more local, close to clients, out okay. in, in different cities, and we also have tech companies. We are very close to the new technology, trying things out, and this is a perfect example of this. It was a crazy ID five years ago, 2017, yeah. and we started to bring in some clients, explore really open-minded, see can we do something on yeah. this satellite data? And then we took it step by step together with our clients. Yeah. And it's a small team, we are like 12 yeah. people today. And you guys are doing business development, so you have to go out there and identify yeah. the kinds of problems that so match the scope yeah. of the scale. So what we're doing is we interact with our clients, do some simple workshops or something, and try to identify like the really valuable problems, like the Spruce Park Beetle, that, that's one mm. of those. Yep. And then we have to sort of look at do we think we can do something? Is it realistic? And we will not be able to answer that 100% yeah. because then there's no innovation in this at all. But we say, well, we think we can do it. This will be a hard problem, but we do think we can do it. And then we basically just go for it. And we, this one we did in 11 to 12 weeks, a tightly focused team uh, and just went at it. Uh, yeah. Super slim process and we got the mm. job done. And, uh, the res well, it's interesting. You have a lot of use cases where you got to go down, do that face to face, yeah. belly to belly, you know, exactly. body to body sales, biz dev, yeah. scope it out, have workshops. Now, this market here, Remars, they're all basically saying a call to arms, more money's coming in, the problems are putting on the table. The workshop could be a lunch meeting, right? I mean, yeah. because Artemis and there's a big set of problems to tackle. Yes. So, I mean, I'm just oversimplifying, but that being said, there's a lot going on opportunity-wise here yeah. that's not as slow maybe as the, the biz dev at, you know, coming in. This is a huge it, demand. It will be explode. Yeah. What's your take explode. on the demand here, the problems that need to be solved, and what you guys yeah. are going to bring to bear for the problem? So now we have been focusing mainly in vegetation management and forestry, but vegetation management can be applicable in utility as well. And we actually went there first. Had some struggle because it's quite detailed information that's needed, so we backed out a bit into vegetation in forestry again, but still, it's a lot of application in, in uh, utility and vegetation management in utility. Then we have a whole sustainability angle. Yeah. Think about yeah. auditing of uh, rogue harvesting or uh, carbon yeah. offsetting in the future, even biodiversity offsetting. Mm. That could be used. And, and just to point out and give a little extra context, all the keynotes talk about space yeah. as a global climate solution potentially. The yeah. discoveries and are also the imagery they're going to get. So you yeah. kind of got you know, top down, bottoms up if you want to look at the world as yeah. bottom and space kind of coming together. 
this is going to open up new kinds of opportunities for you guys. What's the conversation like when, you, when this is going on? You're like, oh yeah, let's go in. Like, what are you guys going to do? What's the plan? Uh, going to hang around and ride that wave? I think it all boils down to finding that use case that needs to be solved, because now we understand the satellite scene, they are there. We could, there is so many new satellites coming up, already available, they yeah. can come up. The cloud platform, AWS, it's great. We have all the capabilities needed. Yeah. We have the AI ML models needed, mm -hmm. data science skills. Now it's finding the use cases together with yeah. clients and actually it's deliver on uh, them one by one. It's interesting, I'd like to get your reaction to this, Marcus, too, yeah. as well. What you guys are kind of, you're a lot bigger and, and, and bigger than some of the startups out there, but the startup world, they find their niches and they, the workflows become the intellectual property. So this, your techniques of layering, I almost see is an advantage hmm. uh, out there. What's your guys' view of that intellectual property of the future? Uh, open source is going to run all the software, we know that. So software's going open source. Scale and integration and then new kinds of ways are new methods. Hmm. I won't say for just patents, but like, just for intellectual property, differentiation. How do you guys see this as you look at this new frontier of intellectual property? That's, it's a difficult question. I think it's, uh, there's a lot of potential if you look at open innovation and how you can build some IP which you can out-license and some you utilize yourself and you can build like a layered business model on top so you can find different channels. Some markets we will not go for. Maybe some of our models actually could be used by others where we won't go. Uh, so we want to build some IP, but I think we also want to be able to release some of the things we do. Open uh, works. Yeah, because it also builds presence. It, it, Community. It, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. This, this problem is really hard because it's yeah. a global thing. And, and it's, imagine if, if you have a, a couple of million acres of forest uh, and you just don't go out walking and trying to check what's going on yeah. because it's, you know. That's <laughs> Manual's <laughs> hard. Yeah, it's impossible. <laughs> so you need this to scale uh, and, and it's a hard problem. So I think you need to build a community yeah. because this is, it's a living organism that we're trying to monitor if you talk about the vegetation yeah. and forest. It's, it's changing throughout the year. So if you look at spring and then you look at summer and you look at winter, it's completely different to what you yeah, see. Yeah. So it's That's interesting. And so, you know, I wonder if, you know, you see some of these crowdsourcing models around participation, you know, small little help, but you, that doesn't solve the big yeah. puzzle. Um, but you have open source concepts. Yeah. Uh, we had Anna on earlier, yeah. she's from the Amazon Sustainability Data Project. Yeah, exactly. And this just like open up the data. So it's a data party for her. So in a way, there's more innovation coming, potentially, yeah. if you can get that thing going, right? Get the projects exactly. going. And all this, actually, our work is started because yes. of that. Exactly. So, European Space Agency, they decided to hand out this Copernic program and the, the Sentinel satellites, Sentinel-1 yeah. and 2, which we have been working with, they are freely available. It started back in 2016, I think. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, that's why we have this work done during several years. Without that data freely available, it wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure. Well, what's next for you guys? Tell, tell me what's happening, give us the update. Put a plug in for the, for the group. What are you working on now? What's, uh, what are you guys looking to accomplish? Take a minute to put a plug in for the opportunity. I would say scaling this. Mm. Scaling, moving outside Sweden, of course. We see yeah. our model that they work in, in US. We have tried them in Canada. We see that we work. We need to scale and do field validation in different regions. And then I would say go to the sustainability area yeah. of this. Because yeah, there, I, there is a lot of great potential. International too, it's huge. Yeah. One area I think that is really interesting is the combination of understanding the like the carbon sink and the sequestration and trying to measure that. Uh, but also on top of that, trying to classify certain keystone species habitats to understand yeah. if they have any space to live and how can we help that to sort of grow mm. back again. Mm. Uh, and understanding the history of the sort of the forest. You have some data online, but trying to map out how much of, of this has been turned into ag agricultural fields, for example. How much, how much of the yeah. real old forest we have left that is really biodiverse? How much is just eight years young? Mm. Uh, to understand that picture, how can we sort of move back towards that blueprint we probably need to? Yeah. And how can we digitize and change forestry and, and the mod business models around that? Because yeah, you, yeah. you can do it in a different way or you can do both 
some harvesting, but also yeah. not sort of ruining the whole They, they can be more efficient, you make it more productive, yeah. Yeah. save yeah. some capital, reinvest yeah. and, it in better and, ways. And you have robotics, and, and yeah. that's not maybe something that we're not so active in, but I mean, starting to look at how yeah. can autonomy help forestry. Uh, inventory damages, yeah. flying over, using drones yeah. and satellites. Mm. Yeah. Uh, you have people looking into autonomous harvesting of trees, which is kind of insane as well, because they're <laughs> pretty big. <laughs> But this is also happening. So I mean, yeah. what we're seeing here is basically. I mean, we I read a story multiple times on? called on sail drone. One of my favorite stories: the drones that are just like getting bobbed around in the ocean, and they're getting great telemetry data because they're indestructible. You know, they can just yeah. bounce around, mm -hmm. and then yeah. they just transmit data. Exactly. You guys are creating a opportunity. Some will say problem, but <laughs> by opening up data, you're actually exposing opportunities yes. that never been seen before, because you're like, it's that scene where, that movie Jodie Frost, The Contact, where open up one little piece of information and now you're seeing a bunch of new information. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at large scale data, that's going to open up new opportunities to solve problems yes. that yeah. were never seen before. You, exactly. you, can, you can't automate what you can't see, no. right? That's the thing, so. And we haven't even thought that these problems can be solved. It, it's basically, this is how the world works now. Yeah. Because before, when you did remote sensing, you yeah. need to be out there. You need to fly with a yeah. helicopter yeah. or you put your boots on, out and go out. Now you don't yeah. need that anymore. Yeah. Which open up that you could you be- You can move your creativity to another it. problem. Now you open up another problem space. So exactly. again, I like the problem solving vibe of the, it's not like, oh, catastrophic. Well, well, well the Earth is on a catastrophic trajectory. It's like, oh, we'll agree to that. But it's not done deal yet. No. <laughs> you got plenty of time, right? So like, but let's get these problems on the table. Yeah. yeah. And Make I think this is, this is the new method. Well, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate the conversation. Thanks a lot. Love it. Opening up new world opportunities, challenges. There's always opportunities when you have challenges. You guys Definitely are in the middle yes. of it. Yeah. Thanks for coming Definitely. on. I appreciate Thank it. Thank thanks, you. guys. Okay, Capgemini in theCUBE. Part of Capgemini, uh, so Getty, part of Capgemini here in theCUBE. I'm John Furrier, the host. We'll be right back with more after this short break.